All right, everybody, let's, we're going to begin. Um, first of all, I should say it appears the weather gods may smile upon us when we're done with this, with the uh, public portion of this meeting. We're going to have some hors d'oeuvres and cocktails on the terrace. And it appears the rain will let up, so we'll be able to do it on the terrace with views of the Hudson River. So I should thank who is, unfortunately, Richard Edelman is not here, but he has provided us with this venue and with the, the, the terrace. But he has a good excuse. He's in Beijing today. I should also say that this is the first time in committee history that courtesy of a grant from Bill Rhodes, we are live streaming this program. So given we are live streaming this program, please behave. <laughs> so as you all know, the committee was formed um, in 1966. I want to think back to that period. China's role in the Korean War remained vivid. McCarthyism was a recent memory. And thousands of Americans were dying annually in the war in Vietnam. A group of American scholars joined by far-sighted civic, religious, and business leaders saw the need for wide public discussion of China and its relations with the United States, recognizing that the PRC's isolation might be harmful, not beneficial, to the United States. From those early days and throughout our history, the National Committee has been working to improve ties and understanding between our two nations. However, today, we are at a point where fear and mistrust on both sides are straining those ties, creating misunderstanding, and causing some to doubt the very concept of constructive engagement. Many in the executive and legislative branches, as well as some in the think tank and academic communities in the United States, argue that constructive engagement has not served the American people, and that China's WTO accession was bad for Americans. The president's national security strategy argues that China, along with Russia, are strategic competitors, despite the fact that it is America, not China, that has withdrawn from the Paris Accords, UNESCO, and the Iran, Iran Agreement. It brands China a revisionist power. Among other ideas, they propose tariffs on Chinese goods to restrict Chinese investment in the United States, to direct military expenditures to counter a rising China, and to limit Chinese students coming to the United States. These policies destroy the foundations of the US-China relationship, misdirect our 21st century priorities, and hurt the American people. Indeed, today we are at an inflection point where commitments need to be made. Our commitment is to the values and vision of our founders who believed that engagement was better than estrangement. While many of these policies and views are based on exaggerations and distortions, in truth, it is not difficult to see why we are here. Over the past few years, the Chinese government has adopted policies that have alienated even ardent supporters of constructive engagement. In the business and trade realms, we see entire sectors closed to foreign investment, a lack of transparency in rulemaking, regulatory enforcement that discriminates against foreigners, stalled third plenum reforms, lack of the rule of law, and high tariffs that should have been re reduced decades ago. In the academic space, the denial of visas for those who write negatively about China alienates academics who believe in academic freedom. In the nonprofit sector, 
the introduction of the international NGO management law has made it more difficult for even non-controversial NGOs to operate in China. The blocking of Facebook, Google, YouTube, Twitter, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal sows distrust among Americans who rely on their news and for communications. Finally, China's reclamation and militarization of islands in the South China Seas in violation of international law lead believers in the international system to question whether China can be the responsible stakeholder that Bob Zelik called on it to be in our dinner in 2005. In the US, there are those who consistently misconstrue China's actions and exaggerate China's impact. Claims, for example, that America has lost 6 million manufacturing jobs to China ignores the fact that automation and technology, along with relocation of jobs to Mexico, Canada, and other countries are important causes. The focus on bilateral trade deficit ignores the fact that in the last 10 years, China's current account surplus to GDP has dropped from 9% to 1.5%. This trend more accurately reflects China's surplus rather than bilateral trade statistics. On the strategic side, the same occurs. When I was talking with a senior military official recently, he said to me, China's action in the South China Sea is the equivalent of Russia's action in the Ukraine and Crimea. Why I believe China's action in the South China Sea is inconsistent with international law, let's keep in mind that more than 10,000 people died in Russia's invasion of Ukraine. None have died in the South China Sea. So constructive engagement has not failed. It needs to be rebooted to meet challenges that our founders could not have envisioned. Let's briefly look at the history. A few years after we started to engage with China, American soldiers stopped dying in Asia and haven't died since. Constructive engagement coupled with China's reform and opening have lifted hundreds of millions of Chinese out of poverty. The China Jerry and I moved to in 1979 required that we obtain a travel permit any time we left Beijing to travel within China. When Chinese graduated from high school or college then, the state assigned them places to work. They couldn't get a passport. It is so different today. Now, 120 million Chinese travel abroad annually. And these trips generate, for Americans, more than $33 billion. China has grown to become the third largest destination for American goods and services. And as we heard from President Trump this morning, the number one purchaser of agricultural products. Trade with China supports 2.6 million American jobs. And we expect that by 2030, we'll have over 520 billion in exports to China. Chinese manufacturing has also lowered prices in the United States for consumer goods and put in the average American family, 850 additional dollars. I always joke, rich people don't care, but the average American family cares a lot. While China is still not the responsible stakeholder we hoped it would become, it has come a long way. China provides, provides the largest number of UN peacekeepers among the permanent five of the United Nations. 
Its Belt and Road Initiative and Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank has helped fill a need for development finance that multinational institutions have not been able to provide. Most importantly, after almost constant war in Asia for five decades, since constructive engagement, we have seen peace in Asia. This is no coincidence. Beyond the economics, though, constructive engagement has had qualitative benefits. The hundreds of thousands of Chinese students who come to America have enriched the campuses <coughs> and American life. When I hear talk of limiting visas to Chinese STEM students, I realize how destructive the current trend has become. I think of my friend, Ming Xie, who came to America from Guangzhou to study engineering at USC. After graduation, he invented a high-speed biometric fingerprint system that now supplies the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, and other agencies. If the limitations now had been in place when he came to the United States, when he tried to come to the United States, this winner of the Ellis Island Medal of Honor, after whom the USC School of Engineering is named, would have been prevented from studying in the United States. And his contribution to American society would have never occurred. The purpose of constructive engagement was never to make China just like us. It is critical that we are clear-eyed about this, as well as realistic about what is in our power to influence. The goal of engagement was always to make China a productive member of the global community. And in truth, we've made substantial progress. As China becomes more prosperous and powerful, it naturally wields greater influence in the world. This does not make us strategic competitors. It does not make confrontation inevitable. What it does demand is that we prepare for challenges to the United States that the founders of the National Committee could never have envisioned. And constructive engagement needs to adapt to this new reality. We need to honestly face the fact, no matter what we do, China will continue its rise, and we want to do everything we can to make its rise benefit the global community. The question is, how should the United States act in light of an evolving China? When China is characterized as a strategic competitor and revisionist power, and we are told we must spend tens or even hundreds of billions to defeat and deter China. I'm reminded of the words of the great general and later president, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fires signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. And I would add, those who suffer from deteriorating infrastructure that is not fixed, and the undereducated who remain uneducated. Domestic challenges within the United States and China and the world's great transnational issues terrorism, financial and economic crisis, climate change, pandemics, use of artificial intelligence and big data to serve humankind, peace on the Korean Peninsula cannot be solved if we treat China as an enemy. They can only be solved if we work together. So allow me to conclude by saying it's time. No, it's past time that each 
and every one of you participates in this debate because it will determine our future. If you do, and if you do every day the way we at the National Committee do, I'm convinced that the US-China relationship will get back on the right track because in the end, it's the people in this room, it's the people of the United States, and the people of China that will determine the future of the most important relationship in the world. Thank you all. For in the coming weeks and months, we're going to examine how best to operate in our current environment, determining what new programs and initiatives will be most effective, and how we can adapt established programs to meet the challenges of today. So to start this conversation, we've convened a distinguished panel who will look at a constructive engagement through the lens of each of their areas of expertise. So join me in welcoming first Amy Selico, who will address the economic and trade issues, Robert Daly, who will talk about soft power and China's rising global influence, and Evan Medeiros, who will talk about strategic and security issues. You've got their bios. If I gave their full bios, we would have no more time for the program. But please join me in welcoming. We'll then have time at the end of this for some questioning, both from me and the audience. But thank you, all three of you, for joining us today. kick it off since economics is the dominant um, factor in today's news, at least, or Korea, uh, in which case Evan yes, will talk about. Yes, I think about. all three of us actually have <laughs> dominant issues to cover. Thanks so much, Steve, for inviting me uh, to speak on this panel with you, with Robert, with Evan today. It's terrific uh, to be here and talk about my area of expertise, which is uh, economics and trade. Uh, in the not-so-distant past, of course, it was relatively easy to talk about constructive engagement in our trade relationship with China. So many win-wins, so much potential. Uh, given the increasing interconnectivity of our economies and China's rise as a global economic powerhouse. In fact, the Chinese continue their long-standing practice of referring to the trade and business relationship as the ballast stone of Sino-US ties, its essence being win-win cooperation, as the People's Daily just put it yesterday. However, as Steve mentioned, China's economic policies begun about a decade ago, but with more vigor over the past four years, have made it harder and harder for many foreign investors to continue to succeed in China. From the US side, the stabilizer is getting a bit shaky and I'm going to focus on these more pessimistic aspects of the relationship. Just see this year's American Chamber of Commerce uh, survey, where 75% of, re of respondents said that they feel less welcome now in China in the past, even as 75% of them said that they had been profitable in China over the past year, which is in fact a higher number than in the past. Very real concerns exist over China's unequal enforcement of regulations, its forced tech and IP transfer and data localization requirements, preferential treatment, massive subsidies, domestic rivals getting better play in the market than foreign investors. And that explains why so many American business community members did not forcefully oppose this administration's more strenuous rhetorical challenges to China's longstanding unfair trade practices, including talk about putting in place real reciprocity standards in the trade and investment realm to try to force China to bring down longstanding barriers. Many 
like myself, did not agree with the application of tariffs as the way to deal with China's practices that harm U.S. interests, particularly since non-Chinese companies contribute so much to China's exports. But few, myself included, disagreed with the very real problems faced by foreign companies, which USTR's excellent 301 report highlighted, and which also very clearly show that economic ties between our two countries are no longer a stabilizing force. In fact, yet another source of increasing tension, if not hostility. While it seems the administration in D.C. did a pretty horrible job over the past week prioritizing what it wanted to get from China to avoid the start of a trade war, I, like so many others, am relieved that crippling, unfair unilateral tariffs weren't launched this week and instead, dialogue will continue. But will this dialogue lead to the kind of constructive engagement on economic issues that could help stabilize the overall relationship? Unfortunately, I remain pessimistic in the near term for three reasons. Both sides seem more intent on marketing why they are right than accommodating one another. China is anxious to be seen as taking the mantle of globalization and critical of America's retreat from the global stage. In Washington, there's more focus on demonstrating how China is undermining the WTO and distorting the global trading system than working to support multilateralism and promote trade liberalization that would help buck some of, market, some of China's market closing moves. National security considerations are also beginning to dominate economic policy making in both Beijing and in Washington. And this trend has, of course, opaque elements that justify restricting economic flows rather than focusing on ways to open up and talk about legitimate national security concerns while enhancing flows. And then, while China's current leadership does seem intent on continuing to set rules that limit the participation of foreign companies in what will soon become the largest consumer market in the world, our government is having a problem prioritizing exactly which issues it's trying to solve with China. And simultaneously, it continues to alienate allies it needs to build a more formidable coalition with to pressure China to amend some of its industrial policy practices. Opportunities are being squandered. Round one in our trade spat definitely seems to have gone in China's direction. China's leaders in advance of the talks, of course, said that they wouldn't bend to U.S. pressure on unreasonable demands impacting China's core interests, and they didn't. But Ambassador Lighthizer has made it very clear that he's not backing down from issues he wants addressed including forced technology transfer, cyber theft, and the protection of innovation. In fact, I agree that without continuing to push China to fundamentally change some of its market distorting behaviors, as Ambassador Lighthizer has highlighted, I don't think we will be able to pursue constructive engagement with China because we'll continue to compete on the global stage, not on market, market share for goods, services, innovation, but on our characterizations of who, whose policies benefit or harm the global economy, rather than working to find ways forward. So absent tariffs and investment restrictions, what leverage do we actually have to try to create a more level global playing field? While I disagree with my former colleagues at USTR when they wrote earlier this year that the U.S. <coughs> erred in supporting China's entry into the WTO, I do agree with another statement made in that report, that WTO rules alone are not sufficient to constrain China's market distorting behaviors. We need to work with other countries and with China itself to coordinate policies that can have an increase and more positive impact on the global trading system and hopefully on China's level of openness. However, some of the actions taken by our administration over the past 16 months, pulling out of TPP, renegotiating other trade pacts, 
uh, putting in place 232 sanctions, pulling out of the Iran deal, will definitely make cooperation with others on China and with China itself more difficult. We have powerful leaders in Beijing and Washington, D.C. who do not trust market forces and who instead are committed to industrial policies that increase protections of their economies. Of course, we will continue to be economic competitors and rivals with China, but it's hard for me to imagine more stability and more prosperity will be created by China and the U.S. not working constructively to resolve our current very real differences on economic and trade issues. So as Steve said too, it will fall on us, NGOs, international organizations, multilateral trading blocks, companies, to point ways both the US and China need to stand up to, to one another where interests are harmed, to accommodate different policies that enhance rather than restrict trade and investment flows and protect legitimate national security interests. The National Security, the US Chamber of Commerce, so many others are trying to do this. We need to get better receptivity from our policymakers who seem to think the stable, stabilizing ballast of trade ties still exist in the bilateral economic relationship. It doesn't. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, Jen, National Committee, for bringing me here tonight to get a chance to speak with so many old friends uh, in the audience. I have been asked to speak about soft power, which is an extremely broad topic. And I'm going to try to focus in on it by looking at what has become standard paragraph two boilerplate in an awful lot of media reports about US-China relations, in which it is stated that, of course, the policy of engagement has failed. This was Steve's theme. And it seems to me that there are three assumptions, broadly speaking, behind this claim that engagement has failed, two of them wrong, one of them correct and deeply concerning. And I would like to come at uh, soft power by looking at these assumptions. The first seems to be that engagement has failed or was mistaken from the get-go, historically, because, as Steve mentioned, it didn't make China more like us or because it failed to prevent China from becoming a threat or indeed may even have enabled China to become a threat. These are the kinds of claims that one hears about the failure of engagement. I think Steve has already made uh, the very valuable point, the essential point, that making China more like us was never the policy argument for engagement. Uh, it may have been an emotional factor on the parts of a great many participants subnationally, uh, but it was not the policy. Engagement was intended to encourage China to value international integration. And I would argue, again, echoing Steve, that engagement has been extremely successful, if far from satisfactory, and remains an essential pillar of any American policy toward China that is going to be uh, effective. China's level of integration, and again, go back to the baseline when these policies went in place. Go back to the late 70s. I know that many of you were there in the early 70s and remember what China was. <coughs> Begin there, and China's degree of integration is high if problematic. It is problematic in the WTO, but in some cases it also upholds uh, WTO norms. It's not an altogether straightforward story. I would argue that the level of personal well-being, if part of the idea of engagement, at least at the level of individual programs and institutions, was to, if not make the Chinese more like us, at least to help Chinese to live more freely. And to editorialize my own version of this is that we shouldn't want the Chinese to be more like us. We should want them to be fully themselves, recognizing that they cannot be fully themselves until they are freely themselves, I think is a better way to put this. I would argue that until 2013, the beginning of the current era, it was, despite China's continued problems with human rights, probably the best time in Chinese history to be Chinese. And that, in part, was a fruit of engagement of our involvement with China. That involvement, the exercise of American soft power, American presence in China beginning in the 70s, uh, is something I think we should all continue to take pride in. And I've had this discussion with numerous Chinese friends, most of whom after the usual caveats about you don't understand China, end up agreeing 
that of course, while 95% of China's progress or more is due to the hard work of the Chinese people, there is no aspect of China's modernization that you can point to at the street level that has nothing to do with the United States. It's, it's, it's everywhere, and it's something that we should be uh, continue to trumpet as part of the success of engagement. And I'm not talking about the shallower aspects of soft power. The fact that when I first got there in 1987, John Denver's Take Me Home Country Road seemed to be the national anthem. It was replaced <laughs> by the Carpenters yesterday once more for an interminable period. Uh, it's not just that stuff. It's not the blue jeans. It's not the breakdancing competition. It's really about the issues that the National Committee has been at the center of. It's been about the transition, the adaptation, the application of institutional models and best practices that resulted in more efficient governance, that resulted in increased welfare for the Chinese people. An untold part of the story of engagement has been the tremendous humility. We hear a lot uh, these days about Chinese arrogance. We hear less than we should about the humility that the Chinese have demonstrated. And the counter argument would be that it was crafty and was intended at building power. But for those of us who are in these programs, the humility of the many Chinese expert groups who spent an enormous amount of time and money coming to the United States and the rest of the world to understand how we organize at the government, the subnational, and the institutional level. That interaction, and again, I think the committee has been a model of this has resulted in many lives improved and saved within China. To take just two examples, things that I was told would never change. Uh, those of you who lived in China in the 80s and 90s remember that on the days when the pollution was heaviest, uh, you would be told that this was not pollution, this was wu, or fog. This was not wu, uh, this was always uran, this was always pollution. But gradually, through engagement, through American technology, in the case of the American embassies putting out the fine particulate matter uh, statistics through the, the interaction of American scientists, governor, uh, government organizations, and NGOs, as well as those of other countries. Pollution has become a major issue which is now led by the Chinese. Smoking is another one. We thought that smoking was never going to change in China. We were told that it never would uh, in public spaces, indoors. It changed. These also are fruits of engagement. And when we talk about possible programs, Steve, going forward under very difficult circumstances, I think we have yet to explore the possibility of working with China on issues of safety. Food safety, consumer products, pharmaceuticals, uh, these are relatively non-political. We come to them as equals. It's one of the few remaining chances to do something big together, like promising to make the global food supply safe. We need to start thinking about other kinds of programs, other areas, and safety Construction, traffic and transportation uh, is a big one. And again, I think we need to focus, before we get to the geostrategic concerns that Evan's going to raise, remember that China is one-fifth of humanity, and engagement has been extremely successful in increasing the welfare of those people and in changing practices. Not all of the examples are quite so edifying. I'm very glad to see Timothy Brooks here tonight. Uh, he was part of a television delegation that uh, Jan brought to China in 1998. I was the interpreter for them. And Tim was trying to get them. We were looking at the way American television programs are produced and promoted. And Tim kept telling them that you've, you've got to break programming in dramatic shows for advertising because you'll get more advertising revenue and you can make more shows. And they were absolutely adamant. Remember, one of them pointed you at the end and said, it's a trick. And there's a law against it. <laughs> they did it. I don't know if that's a major breakthrough, but you're, seeing you here tonight reminded me of that. Um, so we need to remember, again, that it's not just about balance of power. It's also been about this one-fifth of humanity that lives in China. And through soft power, uh, we made a difference. It has been said, and I don't know what the origin of this is, someone in this room may, that the decade roughly from 95 to 2005, when the fruits of Dungism became clear, this has been called the greatest increase in human happiness in any decade in human history, because of all the people lifted out of absolute poverty. I would argue that in that same roughly decade, the United States had a greater impact on a major power than has ever been exercised by a major power on a major power in any decade in peacetime. And it was through soft power. It was through engagement. So engagement is limited. Uh, it's, it's, we can't make it do everything that we want to do. But it's something that we should stand by. 
It has been, I think, our engagement with, power, with China has been the monument to American soft power over the past 40 years. And as well as a boon to the United States, particularly in terms of the flow of talent from China here. And it has also made it much harder for those in China who demonize the United States to do so. Did engagement fail to prevent China from becoming a threat? Did engagement in some ways enable China's uh, rise? Um, maybe that's a dinner conversation. Um, I think one of the questions we have to ask in response to that question is, would China have become rich and powerful as quickly as it did without engagement? It probably wouldn't have. But would, China, would a China that developed more slowly in the absence of American and Western influence be a greater or lesser threat to its neighbors now that it has attained wealth and power? I would argue that it hasn't. And this is another achievement of engagement. A thought experiment, because when we hear this, that engagement has failed, I think that we sometimes uh, confuse our fears about national security interests with, and our fears about our own decline with the actual operation of engagement. If China were liberal and democratic, would it necessarily disclaim the South China Sea? I'm not sure that it would. Would it lose interest in Tibet or Xinjiang? It might govern them more liberally. But a wealthy, in China and a wealthy, powerful, and more liberal China, I think, would have the same territorial claims and would also seek global ambition. So not all of our concerns about China should be laid at the door of engagement. The second, uh, I think, assumption, this will be much shorter, about, upon which engagement has failed, is that China is monolithic and set in its ways. Game over. We know where China's going. No, we don't. The story of modern China remains the story of change. It's changing. The United States is changing. It's through engagement that we will continue to keep our examples, our models present to China. China still changes despite uh, some of its government pronouncements in relation to the United States. And then the last thing, two minutes, I promise. The last assumption is that engagement has failed because the relationship is now fundamentally contentious. And I think that it's true. It's not a merely contentious relationship, but I think that competition is now more important than cooperation in the relationship. This saddles advocates of engagement with a heavy burden. Engagement must be more responsive to strategic concerns. And those of us who advocate for continued engagement have to define a constructive relationship going forward between a powerful, prosperous US and a powerful, prosperous China. That vision is lacking on both sides. Neither in Beijing nor in Washington has such a vision been proposed. China won't help us come up with one. It's the National Committee and organizations like it that are best qualified to define a goal. Where do we think engagement gets us, given the reality of a more contentious relationship? It hasn't been done. We just had two meetings on this in Beijing. Neither the Chinese nor the Americans had a single idea about this. The Chinese idea is wake up and smell the coffee. It's time for you to move aside. And the American idea is that it's time for China to change its practices. What is the vision that continued engagement aims at? It's not enough for us to assert it. We have to have a plan for it. Thank you. Evan. I've got my notes on my phone. I'm, I promise I'm not looking at Facebook while we're talking. <laughs> Well, Steve, many thanks to you and Jan and my fellow board members for inviting me here today. Um, I've enjoyed enormously being a member of the board, and, and I'm so excited to see all the great programs. Uh, Steve, kudos on a wonderful presentation. I really hope that you post it on your webs on, on the National Committee website. Um, certainly now that it's being live, uh, live streamed, that's an opportunity. I thought it was a very thoughtful, very articulate way to capture the current moment in the US-China relationship. Now, of course, I've been asked to speak about security issues, national security issues in the US-China relationship. And I've spent my entire professional career looking at these issues in the US-China relationship, both as a scholar at RAND and then six years in the National Security Council. And um, to make the point very clear, I'm concerned, I'm very concerned about the direction of national security issues in the US-China relationship. Um, let me make four points. Point number one, I have thought for a long time and I continue to believe that the concept of the security dilemma is the right framework for thinking about 
security issues in the US-China relationship. The, the security dilemma is this idea in international relations that my efforts to improve my security look very offensive to other countries. And as a result, they react. Uh, and that looks threatening to me, creating an action-reaction dynamic. It's a pretty simple, straightforward concept. It's been at the heart of the US-China security relationship, and it's been driving competition largely as a result of issues like Taiwan, US alliances in East Asia, specifically US alliances with Japan, US alliances with the ROK, specifically uh, particular issues on those alliances uh, like missile defense. Now, those list of drivers of the security dilemma in the relationship have grown and intensified in recent years. The most obvious examples are um, Chinese activities in the South China Sea and the East China Sea, in part because to many American policymakers and scholars, they, they threaten some of the um, fundamental American security interests, freedom of navigation, compliance with international law, and then simply questions about whether or not the US military can effectively and credibly project and sustain naval power into the Western Pacific. And Chinese activities in the East China Sea and the South China Sea have, are of a particular variety, what are often called gray zone activities. In other words, the Chinese have very effectively used their Coast Guard to coerce uh, the activities of other countries in the region. And of course, they've done this through creating these seven artificial features in the South China Sea, basically using techniques and tools below the threshold of armed conflict as a way to coerce the behavior of other countries and ultimately be able to establish its claims whether or not they're consistent or not with international law. That has generated, obviously, a lot of reaction in the part of America, East Asia. And again, it's intensified this security dilemma. So while I've often thought the US-China security relationship was best characterized as a low intensity security mm -hmm. dilemma, I think it's basically inevitable that it's now moving into a period of high intensity security dilemma. And that's only going to intensify and increase in the next five to 10 years. Um, as the PLA becomes more active in East Asia, the Chinese just launched their first indigenously designed and constructed uh, aircraft carrier. As the um, Xi Jinping administration demonstrates that it's far more risk acceptant, it's willing to tolerate friction with countries in the, uh, throughout the region uh, as, a, uh, as it um, uh, pursues its interest. And then, of course, as China is just simply more active on economic and security issues uh, through East Asia. So I think we have to simply accept the reality that we have, we have moved into a period of high intensity security dilemma between the United States and China. Point number two, the line between traditional national security issues and economic issues and diplomatic issues is blurring. So the line between sort of the traditional issues that I talked about and the ones that Robert and Amy raised is blurring, which suggests to me that we're in the we're in the opening stages of a process of securitization of the US-China relationship in which many issues that traditionally were seen as economic or diplomatic are now going to be seen through the lens of national security. Now, the economic basket that Amy talked about is probably um, offers the best set of examples. There's the traditional uh, issue of, quote, China stealing US technology, especially through cyber-related means. There's a lot of discussion now about Chinese theft of uh, intellectual property rights, eroding the US defense industrial base, and of course, the issue that is being addressed in the context of Made in China 2025 about China uh, dominating the technologies of the future, the commanding heights of the global economy in the 21st century, integrated circuits and semiconductors, artificial intelligence, advanced manufacturing, drones, et cetera. And so this securitization is not only happening in the economic sphere, it's happening in the diplomatic sphere as well, as China is not only expanding its diplomatic ties, but also uh, more effectively using its arms sales and its traditional defense cooperation to do so. 
So we're seeing the securitization of many issues in the US-China relationship. Point number three, ideology. I think increasingly we're going to, um, we're, we're already seeing in the United States a debate about whether or not there really are competing ideologies. Uh, look no further than some of the very interesting work that Liz Economy at the CFR is doing. I highly recommend you read her very provocative article in Foreign Affairs and her new book that's come out. And as a result of Xi Jinping now talking about the China option, the China alternative, um, I think there's going to be more debate in the United States about whether or not there really are incommensurate sort of models of economic development and statecraft between the United States and China. And if that happens, if the US-China relationship assumes this ideological character, the security dilemma, which is based on the concept of misperception, I misperceive what you're doing, um, the security dilemma no longer becomes the appropriate frame, but rather just full on competition uh, along the lines of what the US experienced during the Cold War. Now, I'm always reluctant to use the Cold War uh, as a frame because it tends to obscure more than it clarifies the nature of the US-China interaction. But if ideology comes to become one of the lenses through which American policymakers, American business leaders, American scholars uh, think about the US-China uh, relationship, I think we're going to see security competition um, become far, far more intense. So fourth and final point, what do we do about all of this? Well, let me, make, let me make a provocative point given the title of this. Number one, we have to stop talking about engagement being the sort of main thread of US policy toward China. Engagement hasn't been US policy toward China exclusively for about 20 years. US policy toward China really has been a mix of engagement as a foundation. It's essential. It's critical. It's easy to do poorly. It's hard to do really well. But there's also been an integration aspect of it, pulling China into regional and, institu and, and international institutions as a way to shape its behavior. And I continue to believe that that remains an important tool. Because just as um, the US interacts with China in very intense ways, China is now interacting with the rest of the world in far more intense ways. And I think that provides a source of leverage for shaping their views. Look no further than the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. That started out as really a, a Chinese initiative. But when you look at the fundamental um, guiding uh, uh, documents associated with the AIIB, essentially they've adopted some of the uh, core governance standards and operational standards for lending that the World Bank and the IMF adopted, certainly on issues of, of social and environmental standards, government procurement, et cetera. I think the AIB is a really interesting example of taking a Chinese, uh, what was originally a Chinese initiative, and now looks a lot more multilateral. And I give credit to the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund for their recent outreach to the Belt and Road Initiative to see if there are ways in which uh, conversations between those, inst those three institutions, the Belt and Road Initiative, World Bank, and IMF, can um, come up with ways to ensure that Belt and Road supports debt sustainability, for example, that Belt and Road becomes more inclusive than exclusive, that Belt and Road doesn't feed uh, this growing concern that maybe there, is, there are different models between the United States and China. Uh, and then, of course, uh, one of the reasons I said we need to t stop talking only about engagement is because there is a balancing component, a security balancing component that has always been part of American strategy uh, toward China. And I think we need to be very forthright, very honest, and very public about it, because that is going to continue to be a part of the US, US policy toward China. And I think that there needs to be a greater public discussion about what kind of security balancing is appropriate, what kind will only feed the intensification of the security dilemma? What kind of balancing will only promote um, this uh, uh, greater sense of ideological competition? And what kind of security competition is normal, natural, and necessary, and you would expect for two major powers interacting in a contested space? 
My view is, like Robert's, is it would be wonderful if the United States and China could come up with some sort of grand design for how to manage the relationship, a geopolitical modus vivendi to figure out what our respective roles and responsibilities are in East Asia. right? But gone are the days of Potsdam and Yalta. The world doesn't work like that anymore. You're not going to have Xi Jinping and Donald Trump, chuckles aside, sit down and figure out how they're going to um, manage competing economic security and diplomatic uh, interests. So what does that leave us? That leaves us in a world where we're basically, the United States and China are essentially going to be groping forward episodically through competition, cooperation in economics, diplomatic and soft power, and, and on security issues to figure out what that geopolitical modus vivendi is. And you know that is a precarious piece of business, because what it means is this process will be done episodically. It will be done through debates about trade and tariffs. It'll be done through discussions about Belt and Road. It'll be done through uh, discussions about modernization of US military forces and Chinese military modernization, which means the future is going to look uh, pretty messy. But I think the more public and forthright we can be about high quality constructive engagement, really good integration strategies to make Chinese initiatives more inclusive than exclusive, and that it's OK to have security balancing, that there are certain issues, security, security interests, where we simply are not going to agree with one another. And uh, there's going to be uh, competition. And of course, the challenge is to make sure that that competition is uh, one that stays at a level that doesn't break out into armed conflict. So with that, let me stop there. Thank you. Great. In terms of drawing that line, do you think the characterization of China as a strategic rival and um, a revisionist power was useful in the national security strategy? Is it something that you would have done during the Obama years? Well, the Obama administration produced two national security strategies that I don't recall using either of those terms. So let, let me say this. I think um, grouping Russia and China together uh, is, I wouldn't have done it. I disagree with it. I think it obscures more than it clarifies. Uh, and I think there are important differences in both the character of the states as well as their bilateral relationships with the United States. Uh, I don't particularly have a problem with calling China a strategic competitor, but I think we get wrapped around the axle of these terms too much. My main complaint with the national security strategy is it seemed like a document that was more about attitude than actually solving problems. It was sort of a, it, it read like a statement of frustration. And the use of the term strategic competitor, I interpreted as sort of uh, trying to make a statement that Trump is different than President Obama. But yes, is there competition in the US-China relationship? Absolutely. Is some of it of a strategic quality? Absolutely. Does using the term strategic competition undermine the possibility of cooperation? Absolutely not. There should have been more of that in it. Does, it, does using the term strategic competition mean rivalry is inevitable? Absolutely not. So you know, these terms, I, I think uh, we can obsess about them a little too much. but. You know, they, they have some value. I had to smile when you talked about AIIB, because we happen to have in the audience the drafter of the constituent documents for AIIB. So Natalie, since you were the former general counsel of AIIB, do you agree with, with Evan's um, characterization? Do you have a microphone? You can give to Natalie Lichtenstein there. N not to put me on the spot. Not to put you on the spot. I wasn't <laughs> no, going to let you get away with that. I think it was correct, but go ahead. Natalie just did a book program with us. Which was, which was great. Uh, no, I, I think actually that in terms of AIB, it really um, is, I mean, you could say it's very much like stealing the intellectual property of the World Bank um, but, and the Asian Development Bank and a few others. But I feel it felt a little bit like, you know, what was it, 30 years ago when we used to talk about build, building the Boeing 708 um, instead of the 707. So I think it is very much like the others. I think in terms of where you see China going in the future, 
it is interesting because you take these structures and they take a life of their own. And so in some of the ways in which the US lives through being the largest shareholder in the World Bank and how that changes your views and your concerns about the institution and its financial status and about debt sustainability. Being, being the largest shareholder in an institution is very different from being the greatest critic. Um, and so I think if you think about where China and the US will be in a few years, I think that's a very interesting part of China's relationship. Um, yes, you have the same tools, but they play out very differently in different places. So I think they'll get a, learn a lot from that experience. Robert, you, you skipped over Chinese influence operations in the United States as part of soft power. You want to right. talk about that briefly? Well, as part of soft power, sharp power, I mean, this proliferation of jargon. You know, we, had, we had soft power, hard power, then we had smart power. That was Secretary Clinton. Right, uh, which is the judicious application of soft or hard power at the right time, it's gelatinous power. Now, uh, <laughs> sharp power. I do think that concerns about Chinese influence on American communities and institutions is a major new factor in the relationship. And it is one that makes, again, engagement tougher. The national security strategy also mentions higher education as a vector for the loss of strategically valuable knowledge. You mentioned uh, suggestions that we no longer give gra uh, graduate students in the STEM fields from China and other places uh, their degrees. So this, this is, contains an accusation that higher education is to some degree complicit uh, in Chinese influence. We've heard some of these accusations against American corporations, which are accused of being too interested in their profit and not sufficiently interested in national security. We've heard this from senators who are interested in the, in the CFIUS reform bill, which in the main, I actually uh, I t I tend to support, but that language isn't very helpful. This concern about influence here makes it tougher for us to justify positive dialogue and engagement with China, because all Chinese action is seen as building what China itself calls its comprehensive national power at our expense. So how do we advocate for engagement with this rationale of China's increased integration being either gone or now suspect as being collusion. What it, this is why it's, I don't want a grand strategy. I agree with Evan's description of a difficult muddle going forward. But how do we advocate for engagement in the light of this fear, sometimes justified in the United States, about Chinese political influence, China's growing influence internationally, and the suspicion that all integration now plays into China's game? This is, this, I don't have an answer for this. Um, and that's where I, I, I sort of feel our, ourselves running into a wall when we want to keep going forward with engagement, but I don't think we've come up with a, a rationale for it yet. And the influence, China's influence here, and Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the UK, Western Europe countries have this—they have the same concern. It's growing. Can I come in on this, Steve? Yeah. Because I think I think it's important when you look at the sort of the balance sheet of the integration argument. You know, has pu pulling China into the international community has it effectively shaped Chinese mm. behavior? And I think that the the balance sheet is actually. Um, uh, it's not bad. I mean, if you look at the issues of um, nonproliferation, UN peacekeeping activities. Right. Um, I mean, there are many Fighting areas. Ebola. What's that? Fighting Ebola. Sure. I mean, things. international health. I mean, there are a variety of different areas where it's clear that the quality of China's contribution um, has changed and evolved over time. Right. So I mean, simply pointing to their frustrating behavior on maritime issues, their disregard for UNCLOS and international law, I mean, those, those are problematic. But I don't think that that, uh, that evidence um, or those cases shouldn't be evidence of the complete failure but of But this case isn't being made in the public sphere. It's not in the media. Congress doesn't seem aware of this. How do you, how do you make? that case in the face of all these concerns and what you call the securitization of the economic and other issues doesn't seem to be a voice. The National Committee has its work cut out for us. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, you skipped over ZTE. Uh, well, What's going on? What, and what are the implications <clears throat> for that in the long-term US-China economic relationship? Well, when you think about, you know, could China be what it is today without the United States? I think ZTE is an example of a case study where, no, it couldn't. That company 
wouldn't continue to exist if the U.S. did go through with this uh, remedy that it's proposed. I think what we heard uh, in Beijing last week, Dan was there with some, some of our colleagues, um, was just what a priority this was for, uh, for Xi Jinping, but also the lesson he took from it being we have to have our indigenous capabilities because we can't allow the United States to hold such a major part of uh, our, our industry hostage in the future. And so it just reinforces Made in China 2025 in a way that I'm quite sure President Trump was not uh, anticipating when he thought he would work with President Xi on an issue that clearly was, was very concerning to him. We have a very distinguished audience here. So uh, if folks want to ask the panelists questions, um, or I may ask some of the people in the audience questions. Um, but Susan, sure. So. <laughs> Hello, Susan Shirk, Chair of the 21st Century China Center at UC San Diego. Um, I'm wondering uh, if the panelists and Steve, uh, what you make of China using this term core economic interests now? Uh, because in the past, it's been pretty careful about how it used that term, which basically means it's stuff we're prepared to die to defend. Is it just a way of trying to uh, narrow the wind space to show resolve and firmness, or is there something else to it? I'm wondering what you make of that. I, I can't really answer that well. I mean, I certainly can think of what China is considering its core economic interests, and I think you're absolutely right. They're signaling a red, you know, really, truly a red line here. And um, I think that for China, when it, when it is considering the 21st century, some of these interests are as important as the traditional political core interests have been, uh, sovereignty, <laughs> territorial integrity. And now um, sovereignty is included in how it decides that it wants to promote the economic development of the Chinese economy. I interpret it as non-negotiable, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. just the way everything. Taiwan, mm -hmm. Taiwan, Tibet, and Xinjiang were not, you know, core interests, non-negotiable. Um, these, by characterizing certain aspects of these as core economic interests, it's all, we're not prepared to compromise on them. Susan, I think it'd be, it's important to know the context in which they're used, and I don't know, so let's talk afterwards, because you know, if, if it's a very senior Chinese government official that uses, has used these terms, I think it's very consequential. It's clearly a um, message of resolve in order to generate leverage. But more importantly, it's, I would interpret it as the Chinese probing the boundaries, basically seeing, um, you know, how much can they get? How much can they push the United States? And they clearly understand the history of the US-China debate about core interests. I was at the NSC at the time. It's a very comp long, complicated story. But um, you know, it, it's, it's pushing the boundaries, for sure. I mean, it's, it's moving the goalpost. It's, it, if, if it's really said by authoritative senior Chinese officials, it's a big deal. Over here. My name is Larry Bridwell. I teach an MBA program at Pace University. And there's this whole issue about whether the US is going to be multilateral or not under the Trump administration. And I have a question uh, for uh, Amy Selico uh, about the future of the WTO. What do you think China is going to do? And what is the United States going to do? And I don't know if you agree with the argument that when it comes to economic trade, that the WTO is the essential forum for the future. I, um, I'll cut to the chase. I don't think, unfortunately, the WTO is the essential forum for the future, only because we've had so much uh, difficulty in actually expanding its, its the, the rules and the liberalizations um, under the WTO structure. And this well predates China taking 
a strong, uh, different set of tactics to, in some ways, work around WTO rules. Uh, I think that the case, the cases that China brought against the United States and the European Union about granting China market economy status, whether it was required to do so at the 15-year mark after WTO accession, that I think will be quite consequential for the future of the WTO, mainly because the United States may break, in this administration, is threatening to break with the WTO if uh, the WTO rules against the US in that forum. The United States, on the one hand, has said it wants to reform the WTO system. On the other hand, it's being obstructionist right now in, in preventing the appointment of judges so that cases can be heard. Uh, but I, uh, from my perspective, the WTO has been an incredibly effective tool um, for demonstrating to China the kinds of rules that it needs to adhere to. And China has been an astute student of WTO rules. I think uh, within China's bureaucracy, they're incredible experts on this. But uh, like, the, uh, like USTR has said this year, um, the WTO isn't enough likely to constrain any country, the United States included, from acting outside of WTO rules and rules that govern um, a, a liberal economic order. And so I don't think it's going to be the savior in the 21st century. The challenge is what, what will be. And I think there were opportunities for multilateral trading <coughs> blocks to, to develop standards for trading rules and investment rules, something that, of course, the WTO leaves out. Um, and that takes a lot of hard work. And RCEP and TPP are two examples of multilateral trading blocks that haven't been terribly effective, although I must give TPP credit, it's going forward without us. We have two, two of America's great experts who want to speak, but Professor Cohen and then Professor Harding. Oh, thanks. Uh, this is a terrific discussion. I'm delighted to hear it. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, my overall question is, are we <coughs> suffering from a lack of imaginative ideas. Uh, we're so preoccupied with the details, whether you talk about the South China Sea or what China is doing to people in Xinjiang, et cetera. But are we lacking ideas? For example, on security, uh, we used to hear a lot of ideas about how Taiwan might be fitted in uh, to a peaceful greater China relationship. I think those ideas have gone by the boards. Do we need imaginative ideas now how to deal with the South China Sea? Uh, I was impressed with this point about multilateralizing certain economic institutions like AIIB. Is it possible we can multilateralize problems like what China is doing in the South China Sea? Are, are we making suggestions to them uh, offers to them that I know they're unlikely to accept them, but I think we should keep this effort up. Uh, there was an article the other day about uh, uh, Taiwan's treatment of Itu Aba, Taiping Dao. Uh, Taiwan at least is using peaceful ideas to demonstrate that these islands can have a peaceful uh, aspect. They need not be militarized. On the other hand, Taiwan has not accepted the idea some of us have put forward about internationalizing Itu Aba, making it a center where several countries in Asia can cooperate. Uh, should we be trying more ideas about dealing with the seven Chinese military <coughs> installations that we have? On the other front, soft power. I think Robert gave a lot of emphasis to the US use of soft power, but we ought to be thinking more about human rights, political and civil rights specifically, and the impact on China's desire for soft power, that locking up perhaps almost a million people in Xinjiang as they're doing now, mm. and the world until recently has paid no attention to it. What should we be doing? Should we be using the Magnitsky Act to say the leader of the Communist Party in Xinjiang should have sanctions applied to him? 
Uh, is that the way toward constructive engagement? Or is China, because of the Xi Jinping, bent on greater totalitarianism? Is China deserving not of constructive ideas, but forceful opposition? What's the role of sanctions? Mm -hmm. Is there an imaginative use of sanctions? <laughs> Well, first, as I said, I think there is a dearth of new ideas, highly imaginative or otherwise. Say about a month ago, um, a small group, two, two groups of Americans were sort of summoned to Beijing by two different Chinese groups for off-the-record sessions, and we're told, you know, this relationship is going downhill. It's a downward spiral. Can we keep it from going into free fall? Are there any ideas? And there weren't. You know, we compared notes afterward. Um, most of the Chinese there who are old friends and interlocutors were reciting talking points from the Shiist catechism uh, and were mostly looking for uh, the United States to accept reality. Um, a senior, this is off the record, but a, a senior Chinese interlocutor known to all of you. We're uh, live streaming. In case <laughs> yes, this is off the record and shouldn't be. Yeah. Uh, a, senior, a, a, a senior Chinese official said, if, if, if it must be competition and rivalry, well, so be it. And this was not said in a threatening or aggressive way. It, it was plaintive. It was regretful because of all of the common history of mutual benefit that we've had together. So the, and the Americans were equally guilty of a lack of imagination. For the sorts of things you're talking about, uh, there's a prior step, which is staffing up the bureaucracies. Uh, none of these kinds of, whether it would be sanctions or new kinds of dialogues or multilateralization, they require a fully staffed State Department and, and a American government that's really committed to multilateralism and to global leadership. And I think we may still be several steps away from that. Professor Harding, and then we're going to have to call, well, we'll be out of time. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, I have two points I want to make and then ask the panel to comment on them, one on engagement and the other on competition. I think we can really set aside the issue of engagement because I think it's not as controversial as many people seem to think. The origin of the term, as I recall, was in the fairly early 1990s. It was proposed uh, under the phrase uh, uh, comprehensive engagement by then Secretary of State Christopher. And it was basically a response to the cutting off, basically, of high-level official dialogue as the result of the Tiananmen crisis. And basically, it was a call to re-engage with China uh, at all levels, from track two up to the highest levels, and comprehensive meaning that it should not be focused only on human rights. And I don't think anybody is really arguing that against continuing a policy of comprehensive engagement. The issue is how to make that policy, that process, more productive. Because I think there is a sense, and Steve, you laid out very well all the areas of disappointment, there is a sense that engagement has not uh, achieved the results in many areas that we would like. And I'm not talking about unrealistic expectations about turning China into a democracy, but I'm talking about more realistic concerns. So I think we can really set that issue aside. Engagement, I think, is understood to be an essential part of American policy towards China. Secondly, I think the relationship is going to be, is already competitive. I agree that for it to move even more into the strategic realm, and this is where I think Evan has made a very important point, uh, is uh, it's extremely costly at best and risky at worst. And I think that we should really talk to the Chinese about how we limit uh, strategic competition, perhaps through some kinds of arms control arrangements. It's interesting that we have had virtually, as far as I know, no discussion of arms control with the Chinese, whereas we had a very robust discussion, sometimes frustrating with the Russians, uh, about arms control throughout the, uh, throughout the Cold War. Uh, so while we prevent it, try to prevent it from moving into the strategic area, uh, how do we regulate the competition in other areas? In many areas, ideological competition, political competition, economic competition, don't forget, competition is seen to be a good thing, not a bad thing. It's the basis of pluralistic politics and market economics. But competition has to be governed by accepted rules that are honored and enforced as needed. 
And I think that we need a further discussion with the Chinese about now that they are increasingly accepting that this is going to be a competitive relationship, uh, how, we, uh, how we structure it. In other words, to borrow a phrase from them and twisting it a bit, how do we make sure that we are engaging in win-win competition? Harry, I always, I always quote you when I answer that question, which is when you, years ago, you know, you gave, you gave a talk at the auditorium named after you at GW about the three levels of, of competition, the lowest level being economic competition, and you said that was fine, you know, we have economic competition with our allies, it's okay. Uh, next level up, diplomatic competition, and, you know, we prefer to cooperate, but there are plenty of areas where we're going to have different foreign policy interests than the UK, Canada, Mexico, and we're going to compete. But entering into the strategic competition has extraordinary consequences for each society. And in this talk, now it was quite a while, I think it was probably 2006, um, you know, I sat and thought this would be disastrous for the United States given what we needed to spend money on, and even more disastrous for China given what it needed to spend money on, and I still think that's the case. I don't think, given the real threats to each of our society, I don't sit there and say, oh, we're j let's just live with this strategic competition and find ways to kind of limit it. I actually think you go with the fundamental premise and you say, where are the areas we truly are in strategic competition? And are there ways that we can settle them so that we don't have to engage in the strategic competition? Jerry just mentioned Taiwan. Are there ways that we can make sure that we don't compete? During the Mind Joe era, as opposed to now, there was actually great progress in making Taiwan much less of an area where the United States and China compete strategically. The South China Sea, we're constantly giving the Chinese government suggestions that you could internationalize this in a way that it actually would be devastating for China's sovereignty. And it would actually do make it make China the responsible stakeholder that we all hope it will be. And go over each of the areas where there is this competition and Make it, I can't, you can't get, make it entirely go away, but you can certainly limit it and then focus on the real threats to society, the Chinese society and the American society, which are by and large common, where we share them with the Chinese. And the, what US policy should be, even if you're going to have the strategic competition, you understate it and you focus on the areas of common interests and where you know, you're, you're confronting the common threats. Long answer, sorry. Anybody want to add? I, I would just um, say, Harry, thank you for the, thanks for the great insights. I, I profoundly agree with your point that US policy needs to think about ways to regulate strategic competition with China. In the Cold War, arms control was the mechanism to do so. Um, I'm not uh, yet convinced that arms control will play the same role, but you could have other mechanisms. I mean, my interpretation of much of what's going on on the trade on the trade side of the relationship, all of the dialogues that have been happening in recent weeks, is it's basically serves the same function that arms control served. It's a venue and mechanism for managing strategic economic competition. It's sort of a, the, these are conversations that reveal fundamental. Um, dimensions of the intentions of either side. And whether or not that's an accurate portrayal or not, I think your core point is a, an important one where we need to begin thinking about what are the sort of modern 21st century analogs to the role that arms control played to the US-Soviet relationship. Now we all know that those analogies are not persuasive to a Chinese policymaker or to a Chinese audience, but nonetheless I think the 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 point remains we need to think in those terms. I broadly agree with the, out, the approach that you and Jerry have outlined, but most of my Chinese interlocutors over the past year uh, like the trend lines in the balance of power relationship and therefore tend to see calls for regulation and rules 
as really attempts to halt American decline and China's rise by limiting China in some way. And that set of beliefs seems to be what prevents this kind of discussion. And if, if I could just come in here. So I, I absolutely agree with Robert. I think one of the challenges with all of these sort of great constructive recommendations are essentially they're interpreted as a as weakness. Yeah. And uh, further validation to the Chinese that they have leverage to extract more from the United States. And I think it's one of the reasons why I made, made um, my final point that we need, I think, the United States, American policymakers, all of those of us in the room interested in U.S.-China relationship, we, we need to be very comfortable with terms like competition, strategic competition, risk, friction, instability in the U.S.-China relationship should never be something that we welcome, but it should be something we're willing to tolerate and accept um, if we believe it's advancing American economic and security interests. And until we get to the point in which we're willing to tolerate that, obviously in a responsible manner, we're not really going to be able to win in any negotiation with China. I think our time is up. We have uh, hors d'oeuvres and wine outside. And is it raining? Um, well, were and, and, and we have a beautiful <laughs> terrace, which is why we are down here, that overlooks the Hudson River over on that side. But thank the panel for their terrific presentation. And thank you all for coming. No. She said she was going to